I think you should have waited until after the message to applaud. Do you love Jesus? Tonight we're going to be talking about water baptism from an Old Testament perspective. Why do we baptize in water? And uh, let me dig my, uh, my stuff out here. While I'm doing that, if I were to uh, say something to you, uh, you'd follow it up. There's a, there's a teaching term called remez. So if I were to say to you, bacon, say it again, bacon and, bacon and eggs, love and, love and, Adam and, very good, you're figuring it out. Tonight, I want to talk to you about two very, very uh, tremendous subjects uh, that deal with baptism, and one of the words is disciples, and we don't normally link those two words together, but by the time we're through ministering tonight, I hope that's exactly what we do. Disciples and baptism. Disciples and baptism. So if you have your Bibles and would like to follow along, you can turn to Ephesians chapter 4. We'll be reading from the NIV tonight. But first I want to read one scripture from Matthew 28, verse 19. And it says this, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Disciples, baptism. Disciples, baptism. And we'll be talking about all of that tonight uh, as we go before the Lord in prayer. Be with your people tonight in Jesus' name. We ask that the Spirit of the Lord would just speak to each and every heart. Help us, Lord, as we search baptism in a brand new way tonight. Open our, our ears to hear and our eyes to see what the Spirit is speaking tonight. In Jesus' name, add your blessing to those who are being baptized. Make this a special night for them that they will never forget. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen, amen and amen. Reading from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and all. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Baptism is universal. All Christian denominations, so far as I know, baptize. The Greek word for, for baptize, it's translated into our English Bible, baptizo. It means to make fully wet, a ceremonial ablution, especially of the ordinance, ordinance of Christian baptism, to wash. Thayer says it means to dip repeatedly, to immerse. We've all heard stories about the, the pastor who baptized somebody and brought them up and said, do you believe? And yes. And dunked them again a second time. Do you believe? Yes. And dunked them a third time. Do you believe? Yes. What do you believe? I believe you're trying to drown me. <laughs> Dip repeatedly. And we're not going to do that tonight. To immerse, to submerge, as in vessels that are sunk. The Jews are very clean people and they would, they would uh, dunk vessels in water, preferably living water, running water, and to uh, clean them ceremoniously and to cleanse them. Further means to cleanse by dipping or submerging, to wash, to make clean with water, 
to wash oneself, to bathe. So the doctrine of baptism is universal. In addition to that doctrine, the inspiration of the scriptures, the triune God, the virgin birth, the death and resurrection of Jesus, I can think of no other doctrine that unites the universal church as does the doctrine of baptism. Remember, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. We can confidently state that the church universal agrees on the importance and the necessity of baptism. And while it is the one thing that's common and unites the universal church, at the same time, baptism is one, perhaps one of the most divisive of church doctrines. It's the how of baptism that fosters denominational squabbles. There are three de uh, dominant views of the how of baptism. Sprinkling, submersion, and immersion. Most fundamentalist church churches or church groups um, immerse by do baptism by immersions. Some denominations baptize infants using a basin or similar vessel and sprinkling or pouring water over the baby's head. Many of you perhaps tonight were baptized as an infant in one of the old line denominational traditions. My wife was baptized as a Lutheran because if something were to happen to her, her grandmother was fearful that she would die and go to hell if she was not baptized. So infant baptism is practiced today. Others submerge partially with the believer standing in a fount of some sort and, or a basin of water and with water being poured over their head and they're baptized. We as a New Testament church, however, we baptize believers by immersion. Believers who have made a profession of faith, that is someone who's old enough to make a quality decision to follow the Lord all the days of their life. So we immerse, which means the entire body is immersed in water and then brought back up. Baptism by immersion symbolizes the death Re burial and resurrection of the believer to a new life, Jesus, just as Jesus died, was buried and resurrected after three days. We baptize because baptism is commanded in the scriptures. On your screen, hopefully, they can put up a scripture. Mark 16, 15, and 16 says, And he said to them, Go into all the world, and preach the gospel to all creation. Whosoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whosoever does not believe will be condemned. So baptism is commanded in the scriptures. In Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 39, it states, when the people heard this, the gospel, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are afar off. For all whom the Lord our God shall call. Baptism, therefore, because it's a commandment of the Lord, needs to be taken very seriously. I know Christians who have lived for many, many years and have never obeyed the Lord in this ordinance of the church and obeyed Him in being baptized. I'll give you a, a personal example. My great-grandparents, William and Lenny Waddell, were saved during the early days of the Pentecostal revival in southern Iowa. This is at the time when the Assemblies of God had just been formed, and there were revivals breaking out everywhere. And they were born again in a tent meeting 
in the winter time in January. There's a river nearby, the Grand River. They chopped the ice out of the river and my great grandfather and great grandmother were baptized in the Grand River in February. Is that unbelievable? You know what that means? It means they took baptism seriously. And we need to do that. We absolutely need to take it seriously. So we have, first of all, the ordinance of baptism, followed by the origin of baptism. Now, I've been accused of being an Old Testament guy, and I accept. The Old Testament is, in fact, the New Testament concealed. I can think of no New Testament doctrine that is not already recorded in the Old Testament. It's all there. It's there in depth. It's there in richness. It's there for us to understand. The last two decades or so, I have been seeking the Lord through the Jewish roots of my faith. I think it's very, very, uh, it's, a, it's a thing, it's one more layer that we just do not get as Western Christians. We need to understand the roots of our faith. I've been to Israel twice. I can hardly wait to go again. We're going in February. For those of you who have never been, it will change your life. Some of the things that we saw in Israel, we will be revealing. Uh, there's a picture of a mikvah. A mikvah. A mikvah is, uh, is a uh, pit that's, uh, that's been lined with, with stone and plaster that's used for ceremonial baptism. Now I'm going to make a couple of statements here that are, that are going to blow you away. And I want you to hang on tight. Some of these things perhaps you've never heard. Statement number one, the roots of water baptism predates the written word of God. That's worth writing down. The roots of water baptism, our roots of water baptism predates the written word. And while the word baptism is not found in the Old Testament, its near kinsman, cleanliness, is. Old Testament baptism is a composite of various Hebrew Bible rituals that have been practiced since the days of Moses, been practiced by Israel, and still they practice today. I have a rabbi as well as a pastor, pastors, I have a rabbi who lives here in town, and I went, when uh, this subject came up, pastor, pastor asked me to do some research into the roots of baptism, and I told him I'd be glad to do that. The first place I went, outside of the scriptures, was to go see my rabbi, and uh, he's a real living rabbi, right here in this city. Everybody needs a rabbi. And because I may know a little more about the Old Testament than you, you can consider me your rabbi. <laughs> and then you can go to Rabbi Jacobson. What's that, Pastor? Rabbi Gary. Rabbi Gary. I got a little binky hat and everything. Various washing rituals separated the Jews from their neighbors. They began when God revealed himself to them at Mount Sinai. The Lord said to Moses, Exodus 19, verses 10 and 11, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes. And be ready by the third day. I find the numbers very interesting. The third day, there's repetitive uh, numerology in the scripture and have them be ready by the third day because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people and in fact he did he came down in a thick cloud and he spoke to all of Israel and they heard him from the mountaintop but I find it fascinating before the law of Moses was written before the Ten Commandments were written by the finger of God 
on tablets of stone, God had already required his people to be washed, to be baptized in preparation of meeting with him. And I think we should, we should clean ourselves up a little bit when we come to Jesus. Nothing wrong with that. Again, we need to take the things of God perhaps a little more seriously than we do. And all the people said? Some of you missed a good chance there to say amen. In Leviticus, we read this, Leviticus 14. These are the regulations for any diseased person at the time of their ceremonial cleansing when they are brought to the priest. Elements of sprinkling, submersion, and immersion, the three methods of baptism that we mentioned earlier that are in use in the church today, all existed in the Hebrew Bible as part of their sanctification processes, being set apart for God. Elements all existed. Elements are there for baptism. I want to quote a great theologian, your mother. I think she had it right. My mother used to say, cleanliness is next to godliness. I don't know where she got that, but I'll bet your mother said the same thing. Many of you. Cleanliness is next to godliness. A clean body, a clean mind. When I talked to the rabbi about tonight, and I talked to him about mikvahut, or mikvahs, ceremonial washings and the like. He told me just how important it is to our Jewish friends, our Jewish cousins in the faith, so to speak. Ritual immersion in water is carried out in a mikvah pool. In Hebrew, mikvah means a gathering of waters. So it can be a river. It can be the Grand River in February that my great-grandparents went through. Or it can be a tank in a church. I've seen horse troughs and ponds and wealthy people have swimming pools. Pat Boone used to have baptismal services in their swimming pool out behind their house. So a mikvah is simply a gathering of waters. It can be a river, a pond, a lake, or a man-made tank or pool. According to Mosaic law, any person wishing to go to temple was required to have a ritual bath. If you were going to minister to God, if you were, if you were going to minister in any way in the temple, you were required to have a ritual bath. Persons who were getting married required to have a ritual bath. I think if we're clean for one another, we ought to be clean for God. Some Orthodox Jews have a ritual bath before they read the Torah. What if we had to go through all of that just to open our Bibles and read it? I'm not advocating all of this. I'm just telling you the roots of our baptism. Any unclean person is required to have a ritual bath, a mikvah. A person becomes unclean when he or she comes in contact with any of the following. A dead body, various diseases, a person with leprosy. By the way, Jesus touched them. He touched the lepers. And then he told them, go and show yourself to the priest and be cleansed. So Jesus fulfilled these Old Testament laws. A woman is unclean at certain times in her monthly cycle. The unclean person was required to wash his body thoroughly and then go and undergo a ritualistic immersion in a mikvah. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, we do not have the scripture up, but it's a story of David and Bathsheba and David looked down on the roof of Bathsheba. She was on the roof doing a mikvah, a ceremonial cleansing. And David saw her and took her. 
And that changed his life. It changed his, history. But even in his day, they were doing ceremonial baths. Or, if you will, they were doing mikvahs, baptisms. So, the cleansings continued down through time. By the 1st or 2nd century B.C., a monastic order had assembled in the Judean desert in a place called Qumran. Multiple mikvahs have been found by archaeologists there, along with ancient scrolls which describe life in the order. Ceremonial cleansing in mikvahs was a very common occurrence. In fact, it was a daily thing for some. Dr. Nunley, I've been in, I've been in discussion with him as well. When you go to Israel, you will receive a document from him. And there were rules in, the, in that Qumran community about ceremonial cleansing. I want to read one of them to you. you. You'll have to pay attention because it will not be up on the, stream, the screen. But this is from cave number one, and it's one of the scrolls that was found called the Rule of the Community. Anyone who refuses to enter the society of God preferring to continue in his willful heart. Notice some of the words. He will not be initiated into the yahad of his truth, insomuch as his soul has rejected the disciplines and the foundations of knowledge, that is, the laws of righteousness. He lacks the strength to repent, and repentance is a prerequisite to baptism. This person is not to be reckoned with the upright. Defiling stains would mar his repentance. He cannot be justified. Ceremonies of atonement cannot restore his innocence, neither ritual waters his purity. He cannot be sanctified by baptism in oceans or rivers nor purified by mere ritual bathing. Unclean, unclean shall he be all the days that he rejects the laws of God. So that's where the rubber meets the road. Where are you with the law of God? Refusing to be disciplined in the yihad of his society. Only through the spirit pervading God's true society can he gaze upon the light of life and so be joined to his truth by the Holy Spirit, purified from all iniquity. Let him order his steps and walk faultless in all the ways of God. Then indeed will he be accepted by God. Back to our opening comments, Ramez. Love and Adam and disciples and all right, we're moving on. Soon after those days at Qumran, uh, the society was three times. It was breached, overrun, one time was burned to the ground. But soon after that society, a great prophet arose, and his ministry began nearby, very close nearby. You know him as John the Baptist. He came preaching a gospel of repentance and the kingdom of heaven being at hand. And here we have him, Matthew 3, 1 to 6, says, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. This same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and they were baptized of him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. It follows in the New Testament, you can read in Luke chapter 2, about Jesus was brought to the temple when 
He was 40 days old. And Mary went through a ceremonial cleansing in a mikvah, in a baptism. So Jesus was raised by observant Jews who followed the baptismal, the mikvah requirements of, of cleansing, bodily cleansing and spiritual cleansing. Paul wrote this in Ephesians chapter 5, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and he gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. We're cleaned and uh, we, we are cleaned and forgiven through the word of God and the washing of the water by the word. And the purpose is to present her to himself as a radiant church without strain, stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, holy, blameless. So in Judaism, we've got full body immersion and it marks a change in status from being tamay, which is ritually uncleaned, to tahor, which is ritually clean. This is a necessity because anytime a person comes into the presence of God, they must be pure. Tehor. So that's our first two points. Next obligation of baptism. And these will be shorter. I'm obligated first to repent of my sins and to make a quality decision to follow Christ. It's evident from Jesus' final instructions that baptism will play a major part in making the Gentile nations into disciples of the Jewish Messiah. I'm, I'm going to repeat from Matthew 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. That's a key phrase baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I need to be baptized simply because I'm following Jesus' example. He stated it was a proper thing to do. Jesus came, Matthew 3, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John, but John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It's proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. He who knew no sin became sin for you and me. He who did not need to be cleansed was cleansed by God himself. Jesus said, let it not be so now. It's proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. John consented, and as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, immersed. And at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, and a voice from heaven saying, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Finally, the objective of baptism. And this is where the rubber meets the road. Disciples, baptism. The objective of baptism is to teach new converts the importance of obeying God. Baptism is and should be one of the first steps in an exciting new life with Jesus. After this exciting first big step, a process begins that will literally change history for good and for God. So baptism, so to speak, seals the deal, etching into the individual's mind that this decision is for keeps, for good, forever. Next, it's to demonstrate in a public setting that changes, major change has occurred in the life of the individual. Baptism, therefore, is a witnessing tool to the person being baptized, to his family, to his friends, 
and to his church, his community in Christ. So how do we sum this up? Number one, unless you're a thief on the cross next to Jesus who did not have a chance to be baptized, you need to take baptism seriously. If there are some in our midst here this morning who have never been baptized, please ponder it, please think about it, pray about it, and do it the very next opportunity that you get. If you're one of the individuals being baptized tonight, you need to get plugged in. Get to all the Bible studies you can. Begin the process of growing your faith. If you've been baptized for more than a few months, are you mentoring anyone? Two things. Jesus said, go and make disciples of the nations. Who are we discipling? We need to begin pouring our knowledge, our experience into the hearts and minds of new converts. Give them every reason to succeed. Remember, there's someone in our midst that knows more than you who needs your knowledge. Find them. There's also someone in our midst who knows less than you. Find them and teach them. So we all have a task before us, all of us. What will we do? Shall we pray? Every head bowed and every eye closed, please. Lord, we need your help. Tonight, God, in a somber, in a somber way, we approach you with the importance of water baptism, of the importance of obedience to you. I pray a special anointing on those who are going to be baptized tonight in Jesus' name. Make this the most unforgettable night of their life. For those of us who have spent years perhaps even in the ministry. Help us, Lord, to find someone. Help us, Lord, I pray, to pour out into them the things that you have shown us. Help us to find those who need discipled. And help us, Lord, in this endeavor as we obey you and grow your church. In Jesus' name we pray.